Welcome to the Brave Writer webinar about learning how to write using what we call, what Charlotte Mason calls living literature. Literature that has value, comes to life, gives us a lot to think about when it comes to writing and mechanics. So what is the philosophy of writing and literature that Brave Writer embraces? Brave Writer comes from the thinking that quality writing is generated in our children when they have access to an array of authorial voices. And what do I mean by an authorial voice? Well, you know how when you're reading Facebook, sometimes if you don't see like the person's name, just reading their post, you suddenly think, oh, I bet that's Barbara, or oh, I bet that's Ashley, or oh, I bet that's Patrick. Like you can kind of recognize the person based on the content or their typing style or their joking personality. Writing voice is the expression of self that gets demonstrated through the written word. And there are as many writing voices as there are human beings. Writing voice is the identifying factors that make you, you, when you self-express in writing. So just like you can tell the difference between your kids, the way they come down the stairs in the morning, one has light pattering feet and someone else is like, boom, 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 thundering down the stairs. That's what I mean by writing voice. There is this sort of dispositional way of expressing self that when we do it orally, we recognize vocal patterns, intonation, higher low tone, you know, you can hear my voice is a little deeper and throatier. Someone else's might be higher and more musical. So that's speaking voice. Writing voice is similar. It is the selection of vocabulary, whether you string together really long sentences or short sentences, whether you tend to be more lyrical or more just all the facts, ma'am. And each of those kinds of voices is available to us even if we have a preferred style. So a person who is more like a memoirist or an autobiographical writer, they may write from the content of their personal experiences and observations. Somebody else, however, might write from the perspective of what can be quantified, what can be verified. They're gonna write based on facts or data or research. But both people, the lyricist, and the fact-based writer can write in the other person's style. It may not be their preferred style, but they can learn it. Just like you can go from being your sort of jokey, uh, playful self at home and suddenly lead a webinar or a boardroom uh, you know, sales meeting with adults. You can go from being the kind of person who uses slang when you're talking with your community, with your family, with your friends who know where you're from and how you speak. And then you sort of change that dynamic when you go into either a professional context or an academic context or you're being interviewed on television. So these voices that we learn orally can also be cultivated in writing. And what we want to do is help kids hear the way voices express themselves in a variety of contexts so that they start to adopt the characteristics in their own way that still sounds like them, but it's a version of them. Does that make sense? Everyone get that? So when we're thinking about writing then, what we're thinking about is how do we put our kids in touch with these high quality voices, these high quality writers? And what are some of the features that we want to call out? So often in our writing programs that exist outside, you know, you go and buy a workbook at your local supermarket or you put your kids in school and they're sent home with a textbook. So often the focus isn't really on writing craft, how to access a voice, how to cultivate style, how to uh, increase the vocabulary available to that child for better self-expression, the focus is on spelling, punctuation, accurate, accurate use of commas, whether or not they know how to structure an essay. And so the format sort of takes over. And because the format takes over, sometimes we even forget 
that the use of a comma or the choice to use a semicolon instead of a period is actually about writing voice. It's about what we want to convey, not simply what the, the format requires. In other words, the goal in Brave Writer and in our instructional methodology is not necessarily accuracy, it's power. Power in writing. Accuracy is important, but it's a pretty low bar, right? It's like saying, well, my house is clean. Sure, cleanliness is important, but decorating your house decides how people feel when they're in it. Does it feel inviting? Does it feel um, like it's inspiring? Does it lead me to a place of awe? All of our spaces can be clean, but what are we saying about those spaces? That's a little bit what I'm getting at here. We are going to learn the mechanics. We're gonna learn how to use writing in an effective way. We're gonna do those accuracy exercises that help kids remember to use a capital letter at the start of a sentence but we're gonna do it in the context of high quality writing by authors we admire so that we start to see the choice value behind some of those details. So rather than only asking our kids to think about using commas correctly, we're gonna ask them to use them vo vocally in terms of the style they wanna communicate. You might have someone who writes really short staccato sentences and doesn't really need a lot of commas. And then you might have someone else who writes these lyrically long sentences and commas are suddenly essential. Or maybe your child is more inclined to write in a poetic style and suddenly punctuation is optional, <laughs> right? Have you ever read E.E. E. Cummings or someone like Lewis Carroll, where punctuation is a part of the communication. It's not just following the Chicago Manual of Style. Does that make sense? So what we're going to do today is I am going to share with you one of these four books and go through each level and kind of give you an idea of how Brave Writer approaches these, um, these processes. Now, before we look at the books, I just want to make you aware that we have four programs and uh, four levels of programs, and they cover a variety of ages. So for our youngest level that we currently have, it is called the DART. And the DART is for eight to 10 year olds. Uh, last year we did Charlotte's Web. So this is a DART for Charlotte's Web. And inside you will see things like week one and a passage and why we picked the passage and what to note about that passage. Here you go, Instagram. What to note about that passage. We even have pages that are dedicated to how to teach the passage. Can everyone see that? That's because we expect you as a parent to kind of internalize all of the items that we're talking about related to the passages we select from the books. So for instance, in this one, we isolate some spelling words and we talk about dialogue punctuation so that you don't have to remember, you can be rusty if you don't quite remember all the rules. The rules are less important anyway. What we're helping your kids do is start to become so comfortable and familiar, it becomes second nature. It's not just about getting the rules correctly. And then sometimes we even have a spotlight that focuses on punctuation. So here's a good place for me to show you how we think about teaching punctuation in the context of literature. Last year in Charlotte's Web, we talked about cracking the code, cracking the code of punctuation. So let me just read you what we wrote to help parents get comfortable. Punctuation is a foreign language, another language of curves, dots, and lines. Children are learning a kind of Morse code in print that signifies when to pause briefly when a new thought begins, when a question is being asked, or when a thought is astounding or an exclamation is being made. Here are some of the most common marks children will encounter when reading. Commas. This curled pen stroke sits on the line and calls readers to pause, to breathe, to catch our breath before hurrying to the next detail or items in a sequence. It hugs the word 
it follows, but leaves a little, a little gap afterward for the next word. That's one of the ways we use curves in punctuation. What's another curve? Apostrophes. The similar curvy stroke of the pen is a bit trickier to handwrite for kids because it floats in the air between two letters or sometimes hangs at the end of a word. The goal is to keep this floating curve tucked between the two letters without too much space on either side. What's another curve in punctuation? Quotation marks, ready to level up? Your children will find the double quotation marks quite a challenge. Now the curves they make on the page must identically match each other and float in the air and lean to the right or to the left. In other words, as we're introducing your children to punctuation, we're meeting them right where they're living, where they're living at the level of identifying what's going on in that sentence. So often, often what happens with young kids in particular is we're fluent in punctuation. At least we know what all the marks are, even if we don't know how to use all of them perfectly well. And we expect that our kids are reading the marks, but are they? Or are they relying on the fluency they have as an oral language speaker to help them use the right intonation and thereby blow by all the curves and dots and lines? But if we can slow down and start to understand that those curves, those dots, those lines that can go vertical or horizontal actually have contentful meaning that helps interpret what they're reading, they will start to actually use them naturally and correctly. They are not scanning through their brain for a big rule to follow. No, instead, they are working along, listening to the words in their heads and remembering, oh, I'm pausing. What is the curve or the dot or the line I use for a pause? Well, occasionally it's a comma. Sometimes it's a curve with a dot, like a semicolon. Sometimes it's a hyphen. Sometimes it's an M dash. I wonder which one I want to use here because they each inflect a little differently. And I've read writers who use these to inflect differently. And now I'm a writer. Hmm, I'm gonna think about it. Now, do they go through that every time they write a sentence? Absolutely not. But the more that we make them feel like they're in the driver's seat, de determining which path they're gonna take, which road they're gonna follow, the more they have agency as an author, not as a student trying to get the right grade or to write correctly so the teacher doesn't redline all of their work. That's the goal in Brave Writer. We are using literature to teach things like punctuation, grammar, spelling, literary craft like alliteration or assonance. So imagine that you're reading along in a book and we suddenly help your kids understand synonyms. I mean, after all, the synonym is one of those techniques that kids really enjoy. Once they sort of unmask it and help under, and you help them understand what one is. So we might notice that a synonym is being used in a passage in a book, and we spend a little time discussing why. Why do we do this? We do this because if it's living in literature, if we find these punctuation marks, these literary uh, devices, if we find the way the author chose to express self and we analyze that, we're not attacking the child. We're literally spending the energy to deconstruct what the author is doing well. And when we do that, we actually put your child in the role of analyst. So instead of being scrutinized, they're doing the scrutinizing. Instead of telling your child, I told you about synonyms, now I need to see three show up in your writing. We say, let's see if we can go on a synonym treasure hunt. Let's see if we can find some. Now let's see if we can think of some others. What if we thought of synonyms and we replaced all the ones he had? and we see if it changes the character or meaning of this paragraph. Now your child is acting like a person with power 
not a victim of your scrutiny. This is why Brave Writers programs are so powerful. Whenever possible, we put children in the role of agency and we put you in the sidecar, just sort of pointing out the scenery as they drive by it. And then we say, hey, let's pull up. Let's stop here and look at this scenery for a few minutes. What do you notice? What do you observe? Here's something that I've learned about synonyms. What do you think about that? How does that fit with what we're reading right here? How could we play with this and get to know it better playfully without expecting you to produce it because I've given you one instruction and now you need to do it flawlessly or I'm gonna hold you accountable. You're gonna get a B, you're gonna get a C. We're gonna do it until you get it right. See the difference? Accuracy is such a low bar, but it is the most traumatic bar. It feels like an assault. And what we're really looking for is engagement, joy, craft. So I've given you a little taste of how these work and we've got them for all the levels. So let me just show you. The dart was for eight to 10 year olds. Then we have the arrow, which is for 11 and 12 year olds. 11 and 12 year olds. These are from last year, so don't pay attention to the titles. Then we have 13 and 14 year olds, what we call the boomerang. And then we have a program that is brand new this year that is called the Slingshot. And this is for 15 to 18 year old kids. And you can now download a sample if you wanna take a look at it. These programs are all built on the identical premise that we are going to use quality literature to help your kids discover all those pieces that you think they need to know. When to indent a paragraph, how many words might be in a paragraph, what's a prepositional phrase, how do we correct them when they have mistakes in grammar, are they mistakes, are they intentional authorial choices, how do we differentiate the two. We're going to look at literary devices, craft, you know, when uh, we have somebody who is building a factual case, we might stop and notice it. When we have somebody who is using a lot of dialogue, we're going to stop and discuss the role of dialogue. Did you know that dialogue in fiction is the same thing as direct quotes when you're using expository writing? So while your kids are learning the dialogue quote format, while they're reading all these novels with you when they're young, when they get to high school and they start doing expository essays, they've already learned the punctuation and they have a sense of how to integrate quotes into their expository writing. It comes naturally from all those years of focus on dialogue. And interestingly enough, quotes in expository writing serve a similar purpose. They take you out of all this narrative where you can kind of get bogged down and suddenly they speed the pace of the writing. They inject real human beings voices into the writing and we all kind of wake up. As we spend time talking about dialogue, then we're not just interested in where to put the comma and how many quote marks to use. We're actually aware of it as a device as something that is a part of the mission of the writing to achieve a certain effect on a reader. And isn't that what writing is all about? That's why we use novels and nonfiction and poetry to teach the mechanics of writing. So let's go through. I've taken one book from our 10 book lists of each of our levels. The Slingshot is five books, but the Dart, the Arrow and the Boomerang each have 10 books and they run August to May. And then the Slingshot level has five books and they run every other month starting September. So let's start with Renee Watson's Ways to Make Sunshine. This is the February book for the DART, the eight to 10 year olds. And I'm gonna just start with what is the opening hook of the whole book. Now, who knows what an opening hook is? Anybody on Instagram, do you guys know? <laughs> Does anybody know what an opening hook is on Facebook, on Zoom? I'll give you a second. What is an opening hook? I mean, it sounds pretty interesting. The word hook is fun. Yeah, something that grabs your attention. Have you guys watched any movies that don't open with anything but action? So there's no credits, 
There's no context. You just are suddenly plunked down in a wild chase. This happens on every Mission Impossible movie, every James Bond movie. Have you ever seen that? Where it just opens and don't you notice your heart rate goes up and you're like already invested and you don't even know who you're rooting for? You don't know if you're rooting for the guy who's the good guy or the bad guy. Or you see a wedding happening and you don't know if you're happy about it or sad, but oh my gosh, you're suddenly in. That's an opening hook. That's right. It wants to keep you engaged. Now, not all opening hooks are about action. Sometimes they're about other stuff. So one of the ways that I teach the opening hook in our community, um, I see people bringing up Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Web, by the way, has the most famous opening hook in children's literature, which is, where's Papa going with that ax? <laughs> You're amazing. You're immediately like, wait, there's a girl, she has a father, he has an ax. What do axes do, right? You feel immediately like, I gotta get more detail here because I'm a little nervous. That's what an opening hook is. So one of the ways that we teach opening hooks in Brave Writer is we have you stack up 10 books that you just pull off your shelves or from the library and you read the opening paragraph of every book and you decide together which one has the best opening hook. And then you might even rank them and put them in the order you think is best. And then you're gonna discuss why you decided that this is the best sequence, which ones are the best. Will that be the same for every family who had those same 10 books? What do you think? Is there a right answer to which opening hook is the best? What do you think? I am seeing people say no. <laughs> it is subjective, absolutely, because Sometimes people are drawn in by action, sometimes by humor, sometimes by a very slow opening, like it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Why? Because every temperament is different and every book has a different objective. So the goal is to put your kids in touch with all the different ways writers draw in their readers, right? So let's give Renee Watson a test. Let's see what her opening hook is like in this book, Ways to Make Sunshine. The title of the chapter is The Girl Who Could Be King. Hmm. I'm already intrigued. Why are you intrigued by that chapter title? The Girl Who Could Be King? Is there something confusing about that sentence? Girl and King, right? So immediately, I'm like, hmm, there's something going on here that makes me want to read the opening line because I'm already hooked by the chapter title. So here's the paragraph. I am a girl with a name that a lot of boys have. So when the substitute teacher takes role and calls out Ryan, she looks surprised when I answer. I wish Ms. Colby were here. Ms. Colby doesn't even need to take role anymore because it is the first day of March and she's been teaching us for six months. So she can tell who is here and who is not just by looking across the room. Ms. Colby always starts the day off with our thumbs up, thumbs down, somewhere in the middle check-in. This substitute teacher doesn't do any of that. And so I don't get to show my thumbs up for making perfect scrambled eggs and toast this morning. That's the opening to Renee Watson's book. So we've got all kinds of things going on in here that could be explored with your kids. We've got this intriguing chapter title that does not get resolved in the first paragraph. So I'm still like, okay, I gotta turn some pages to find out what's going on. I've got this idea that this girl has a name that boys have, but then I immediately ask myself, do I know other Ryans who identify as girls? I actually do. Wow, I've never really thought about the fact that that would be annoying to have a name that could maybe be accounted for either way. And I have to sort of be standing up for myself, right? Another feature that I thought was really interesting, the thumbs up, thumbs down, somewhere in the middle check-in. I want to show that to you for a moment. Um, I don't know if you can see it on uh, Facebook or Zoom because I don't know how clear it is. I'm gonna show you on Instagram, but it's backwards. It's in capital letters, it has hyphens, and it is 
separated by slash marks. Those, that's a heck of a lot of punctuation smushed into one sentence. Also capitalized, did I say that? So if, yes, thumbs up, thumbs down. Thank you for sharing that inside the Zoom chat because that's exactly how it looks. Imagine, just sort of for a moment, handing this passage over to your kids and saying, what do you notice here? Does anyone notice any punctuation that sort of stands out to them? Does anyone notice any lines, dots, or curves that would be fun to discuss and try and figure out the point? Um, does anyone notice capital letters? Are they for proper nouns? Are they for verbs? Are they for names of people? Instead of telling all the time, tell, tell, tell. Kids, this is a capital letter. This is when you use it. Now use it correctly. What about excavating? What about asking questions, investigation, drawing some tentative conclusions, even making up our own reasons that make sense to us, that help us remember because they are our own. That's what Brave Writer does. So our goal with these products is to isolate a passage like that. And then we write in our guides all kinds of notes that help you draw out that kind of conversation. Occasionally, I get someone who writes to me and says, I have your dart, but that's a lot of reading to do aloud to my child. Yeah, don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not an instruction manual where you sit down and you just start reading our copy aloud to a seven-year-old. No, what we're doing is educating you, giving you a peek in, a way to do this naturally. I'm picturing you like this. You've got your arrow. You made yourself a cup of tea, right? And it is Monday afternoon, and you're letting the kids watch whatever TV is on PBS. And so you drink your tea. Oh, it tastes so good, you think to yourself. And then you just happily open it up, and you start reading. Okay, so that first passage is this. Oh, 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 I see. He's, he's the author and the illustrator. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, he selects the right words to paint a picture. Paint a picture. I'm going to go back in here and see what picture he painted. Oh, I see. Okay, I get it. Oh yeah, humans stroll, airships fly, robots walk. Oh, those are powerful verbs. Okay, I got it, I got it. That's what you're doing. You're educating yourself. Then Tuesday morning, you pull out that passage and you discuss it based on what you took in from us. Do you have to cover every point we cover? No, we give you lots to choose from based on where your kids are. Maybe they already really get powerful verbs. So you're going to focus on the semicolon use. Maybe you are more interested in those synonyms than you are powerful verbs. That's fine. But we're going to give you sort of like a buffet of options of what can be done with this passage. And I hope that you're going to sort of dig in and kind of familiarize yourself and take your cues from us so that you can lead the way naturally for your kids so that it becomes a point of conversation, not a lesson that you are teaching to your, you know, subservient kids, your obedient children. That's not what Brave Writer is. Brave Writer is a deep dive into critical thinking, into exploration, into discovery, not forcing a bunch of information and then testing to be sure that they've got it. Here's what you'll notice. When you approach literature and language arts this way, on their own, your kids are going to start using these literary devices. I cannot tell you how many times I hear from parents who say, my daughter wrote me a Mother's Day card and she was so proud because she used personification to talk about the flowers. Or they'll be reading along in their Nancy Drew series or whatever, you know, Babysitter's Club at, that you feel so bad that they're reading because it's twaddle. And they'll come up to you and say, hey, mom. I just noticed like this string of words all start with the letter P. It's like alliteration in the babysitter's club. And you'll be like, oh my gosh, she really got it. She really got it. That's what this kind of learning is. That's what this kind of system is. It is meant to create that dynamism that actually leads to the outcomes you crave. So we looked at ways to make sunshine. Now let's look at a book that is for the arrow. This year in November, we're reading Ancestor Approved, Intertribal Stories for Kids. 
And this book starts with something that really made me want to share right away. The opening chapter in this book is called, What is a Powwow? What is a Powwow? Now, here's what's funny about this. I grew up in an era where we didn't have a lot of consciousness about the language we used because I'm old, you guys are young, and in the 1960s and 70s, we said all kinds of stuff that we really don't say anymore. So the word powwow is one that's a hanger on for me. I say it and then remind myself, oh yeah, there's something about powwow that's sacred. And so I can't use it to just mean the staff meeting with my business, right? So I was really intrigued that this book opens with what is a powwow, but look how they do it. It's in italics and it's written in verse italics and verse. Now, if you go further into this book, it's just stories in regular text. So a great question to ask is, why? Why does this author start with a poetic, a poetic exploration of the term powwow? And I'm going to read you just a little bit from it. A powwow is friends and family gathered together to honor the creator Kinecosis, man never known on earth who watches over us. A powwow is a way to remember those who've passed on. Even ancestors we did not know who stay in our hearts forever. They are near us always. Within two short stanzas, I don't know about you, it's like a hit to the whole solar plexus for me. I'm suddenly aware that my use of the term powwow was egregious. It's not a business meeting with my staff. It's a way to honor those who have passed on before us. It is a way to honor ancestors. And suddenly, because it's written in verse and because it's italicized, which gives it sort of um, an otherworldly feel in a book of otherwise prose, I am suspending the temptation to judge or appropriate or argue, I'm being invited to listen. I don't know if that's how it strikes you, by the way. You may have a completely different understanding, but that is how it strikes me. And that's why we teach embodied mechanics, literature that helps us discover why we use these tools. Why use italics? It's not just a keyboard function. It has a role of interpretation that communicates to a reader that leads us, leaves us with a sense of felt experience. The name of this book is Ancestor Approved and it is edited by Cynthia, Le I don't know how to say her real name, Cynthia Smith, Lytic Smith, I believe, Ancestor Approved. Gorgeous cover, gorgeous cover. And the book is gorgeously written. I mean, I think you're going to really love it. And also short stories. So if you're used to reading like a full length novel and then you come across a book of short stories, you're being introduced to yet another literary genre, one that your kids may not have as much experience with. And that increases their options as well for how they respond to the things they're learning. They might enjoy writing a short story about a historical moment in their background, as opposed to just writing a report, right? I remember when my daughter decided to use Emma, the Jane Austen novel, she created a fan fiction of Emma set in the Civil War. And she recast all the characters based on the Civil War and wrote it using sort of the chapter plot arc but reinterpreting it in a historical setting. Basically, that's what you do when you are taking an old story like Shakespeare and updating it in a movie like Clueless, right? This year, we're doing that at the era level. We're reading Midsummer Night's Dream in the Leon Garfield Shakespeare, and then we're ending the year with Midsummer Mayhem, which is a contemporary interpretation of Midsummer Night's Dream. As you welcome these other genres into your family when you're reading them, you are simultaneously casting a vision for how else your kids can respond to writing assignments. Now, I'm gonna tell you something that I didn't plan on telling you, but I think this is the perfect moment for it. 
a lot of parents say things to me like, yes, but don't they need to learn to write a report or an expository essay because of college? Yes. And we teach all that in our online classes, in our programs. In fact, we teach it by having them read essays first so that their first experience writing an essay isn't themselves. The first time they read one isn't their own essay. We want them to absorb it. But here's something you may not know. College professors are curious human beings. They are not like your standard issue um, grammar school teacher. They are more interested in new ideas. And I remember in grad school being assigned a research paper and it was um, analyzing a variety of literary forms in an ancient spiritual text. And instead of writing an essay, I wrote my paper in all four of those formats and turned it in. And my professor loved it because I knew I could play with writing. I knew that I could embody these forms and create something brand new that would communicate a whole other level of understanding. So the more that you give your kids tools and other ways of seeing writing, the more options they have for responding to all kinds of content for you, for high school, for college. Make sense? All right, so Ancestor Approved, that's an arrow book. Now, let's look at the boomerang. And honestly, uh, um, the boomerang this year has a wide array, a whole variety of writers. But the one I wanna talk about now is Great American Short Stories. Now, by the way, we have four stories picked this year. I'm gonna to read to you what they are. And they are all available online for free. So you don't necessarily need to buy this book, but if you are enjoying short stories, there's a whole collection in here and there are many, many good ones. Um, but this year we're gonna focus on The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky by Stephen Crane, A Pair of Silk Stockings by Kate Chopin, Paul's Case by Willa, Willa Cather, and The Egg by Sherwood Anderson. These are American writers who've written in the American short story tradition. So why? Why are we studying these people? Because American writers have made an incredibly valuable contribution to the story of literary genres. And the American short story has properties in it that your kids are going to find really exciting. Uh, they do things like what we call a hook and return where they set you up in the first paragraph to think the story is about one thing. And then they have a surprise ending that flips your understanding completely. One of the most um, famous of those is the story that is by O. Henry, The Gift of the Magi, right? You start out believing that there is going to be this beautiful gift exchange and at the end you're foiled, right? You see that it all went awry and yet, communicated something deeper and even more lovely. That is classic in the American short story genre, and I'm not going to ruin the stories you're going to read coming up. So we are inviting students to read one story per month, per week, over the course of a month. We're going to draw out a paragraph for them to analyze in terms of the literary devices, the mechanics. But here's the thing we do at the boomerang level. And I'm going to show you in our boomerang from last year for Emma. We include some really special additional information. We give you an inside scoop box that is going to detail for you what's going on in the context of this book. Um, so for instance, in Emma, we talked about the Bath and London scene in the English matchmaking race of the Regency era. Two hotspots were London and Bath. Wealthy families migrated to London for part of each year for the season, a time for dancing and parties and of course, matchmaking. The Elton's whirlwind courtship is a typical example, etc. So we're giving you context. So you don't have to do all that Googling and Wikipedia searching. We're gonna provide that to you. But then we also go beyond the passage inside the book. So we give you a passage but we always know it is situated inside a much bigger part of the story. So for instance, in Emma, in this one week, we talked about more humorous supporting characters. 
The funniest cartoon characters are typically exaggerations of the foibles of everyday kinds of people. Two wonderful comedic supporting characters in this novel are Emma's father, Mr. Woodhouse, and Miss Bates, a genteel spinster who lives in the village. And then we go through and we give you detail. So what we're suggesting here, and we will do this for these great American short stories, is we're gonna give you enough detail that you're not just teaching the mechanics of writing, you're going to enrich the literary analysis so that your teens can start to develop those skills. And as I shared before, literary analysis, it, it borrows itself over into interpretation of historical texts, of analyzing and understanding social movements, of understanding political context that you may study at another point. Literary analysis is simply the ability to take a deep dive and to apply some critical thinking tools specifically to that text. Now, literature has a set of tools. So does history, so does politics, so does original writing of ancient texts. But once you get familiar with how to use those tools, being given the next set of tools is easier to use, right? So if you've used a shovel, it's easier to learn to use a hoe and a little trowel and all the other tools of the garden. Make sense? Okay, so that's the boomerang level. And then the final level, of course, that is new for us this year is the slingshot. And one of the books that I, oh, I'm so happy that you guys are reading this year is Braiding Sweetgrass. Now, honestly, whether you're an adult or a teen, it's a great read. So if you haven't read it yet and you have no teenagers and you're a grown-up looking for a great read, Braiding Sweetgrass is beautiful. Here's what I love about this book and why I wanted to have this be one of the ones we talked about today. Um, Braiding Sweetgrass is written in lyrical prose by a PhD botanist who has, um, I'm going to try and say it correctly, Potawatomi roots. She is a citizen of that Native American nation. And so here's an amazing amalgamation of depth scientific research combined with the oral tradition and literary history of her Native American nation, combined with lyrical writing for non-specialists, for people who don't know those stories. And she weaves together poetry, scientific data, narratives from her background, and her own family sort of creative memoir style. This book is such a gorgeous example of what can be achieved when you draw on all the streams of self and the variety of literary tools available to us today in writing. So as you can see, to recap, what we do in Brave Writer is we're really interested in high quality literature and its possible instruction value in mechanics, writing craft, literary devices, options of formats, and the way it expands our worlds to include stories and narratives and ideas that would not come to us any other way. There's something about the narrative tradition, the writing tradition, the story tradition that puts us in touch with the affective side of ourselves, not just the business side of the details of data and facts and figures, which is also interesting, but it helps us actually engage those ideas at our very human level. And all the while, you're learning about dashes. You're learning about the semicolon. You're learning how to structure a paragraph. You're learning how to think about this one genre versus this other genre. So if you have any questions at all, we welcome them. But for the month of June, if you purchase Dart, Arrow, or Boomerang year-long programs, you will automatically be added to our Brave Learner Home membership community where we do webinars like this on the regular to support you in teaching those tools. Plus, there are thousands of other families also doing the same program and they love to share and ask questions and show pictures and give good ideas, okay? During the month of June only. So by June 30th, you gotta make the decision. For Slingshot, because it's only five books, when you pair it with help for high school in our college prep bundle for the same price, $129, you will be added to Brave Learner Home. So Dart, Arrow, Boomerang, and the college prep bundle, 
gets you into Brave Learner Home for the lowest price of the year. Any class you take for over $198 or any other group purchase of $198 gets you into Brave Learner Home, just so you know. So there are lots of ways to get in. In that space is where we do webinars just like this, and we do them throughout the year to support you. And sometimes we really drill down and just tackle one literary device, or we'll, we'll talk about one particular um, aspect of what we're teaching, you know, strategies for copy work and dictation so that you know how to implement them the most effectively. Uh, fabulous. It's, it's wonderful to see that some of you have already joined and are already finding it so resourceful. Um, Oh, somebody wants to hear more about accuracy being a low bar. I love that. That's such a great question. The reason I say it's a low bar is because you can actually pay for copy editors or transcriptionists to write for you as an adult. Did you know that people like Stephen Hawking, he couldn't type, or somebody who is blind or deaf or actually is paralyzed? Um, my own daughter has a limiting hand condition that means she cannot type. So she does all of her writing voice to text and the machine does the autocorrecting and she gets a second set of eyes to do the edits because she cannot type. Does that mean she's not a writer? No, it just means that the accuracy that she needs is not fully dependent on her. And that's true for all of us. I just completed a draft of a book and it's gonna go through four copy edits that I have nothing to do with. And I'm a good writer with pretty accurate mechanics. So that's why I say accuracy is a low bar. It matters, we wanna teach it, but what we really wanna teach is facility, feeling comfortable, experimenting, exploring, getting answers to our questions, hiring people or inviting a second set of eyes. Help your kids learn to take responsibility for accuracy more than to feel pressure to be accurate or they won't be as valuable as writers. So that's what I meant. If you have kids who are in multiple levels, we have a trick for you. Only buy one program and aim for the middle. Aim for the middle. So if you've got a seven, nine and 11 year old, do the arrow or do the dart, it's up to you. The DART is probably the middle level between 11 and seven year old, but you could do the arrow. All you need to do is look at the list of books and see which ones you would be comfortable reading to that trio of children. Then you're gonna just modify up or down. So in the arrow, if this passage feels really long, you can use it for teaching and then just have them copy one sentence or one word or three key words or three powerful verbs if your child is seven. But maybe for the 11 year old, you'll do the whole thing. And for the nine year old, you'll let her pick one of the paragraphs for copy work. See what I mean? So you can use these levels, but do not buy three levels because one, you can't do it. Now, if you've got high school and elementary, they may be too far apart. So if you do buy two levels, alternate months. One month, focus on the high schooler. The next month, focus on the younger kids. Can you get by doing that? Yeah because our programs are really needy. And during the off month, you can be doing something else with that child. Just focus on literature and mechanics each, every other month. It totally works. I had five kids, I had to do all that stuff. And they turned out, <laughs> I need to say that. I'm a parter, part of a charter school who will not be ordering until July. Is there a way that you will still qualify for the offer? Great question. Answer is yes. There is a charter school code on the special offer page. Make sure you put that on your purchase order in July and we will give you the same deal that you could have gotten in June. Great question. Will joining the membership help with other subjects like math, science, and homeschooling in general? Thousand and one percent. We have an entire section inside Brave Learner Home called the One Thing Challenge. In that space, we have actual fully developed lesson plans that go across the curriculum for all kinds of topics, STEM subjects and science, all kinds of stuff. Um, and we also invite speakers. So we've had people speak on math, on science, on history and on literature inside of the Brave Learner Home and all those webinars are still there for you. We've been doing this for seven years, so there's a ton to choose from. Uh, oh, can you tell us more about the supplements? Yes, I will do that and then I will get off. 
So Brave Rider not only has literature and mechanics, what we've seen here, dart, arrow, boomerang, slingshot. We've got a program like faltering ownership, okay, or partnership writing. That's another level. Jot it down is for ages five to eight. This is a group of writing activities that you can do with your kids that focus on original thought. So instead of using literature to talk about mechanics, this is going to use writing activity ideas to get your kids to think of things they want to self-express. And at the jot it down level, you're going to jot down those words for them so that they can experience being writers before they even know how to read and handwrite. Now, you might have kids who are learning to read, learning to handwrite, and they can contribute a little. But really, the goal is to capture the mind life at its full peak fluency with you as their secretary, their transcriptionist. So that's jot it down. And that can be paired with the DART for a complete year. Be a fabulous program for you. Partnership writing is the workhorse. It can work with the widest range of kids. So anyone from like ages seven all the way up to 11 or 12, even though it says nine, 10. I did every one of these activities with all five of my kids when they were between the ages of 13 and six, if that helps you to understand how this program is so robust. Inside, you will see all kinds of activities like this one, secret codes. And you will be doing these at whatever level each of your kids can do them. These are all oriented towards original thought and their spelling and mechanics are not as critical because you're working on those using someone else's writing. This is about getting your great ideas to the page at whatever skill set you have. And then faltering ownership is the one that is for your junior high students. Kids who are not quite in high school yet, but need to write that, you know, elaborate report or learn how to do an interview or writing a book review, those kinds of activities. And it is easily a year and a half or two year program because it's got 12 projects, not just 10. And one of them is a semester length project. So this one lasts easily for all of junior high. Um, and you can do these in combination with dart, arrow, boomerang, or slingshot because one focuses on original thought and the other focuses on mechanics and literature. For those asking about the writer's jungle, this product, which is a digital download that you can bind yourself. It's all black and white copy, so it's not expensive. Um, the Writer's Jungle is the manual that I wrote first before anything else to help parents understand the paradigm of writing I'm trying to teach, which is you as partner and ally to your child with a set of processes that help draw out that original thought. So when you buy a bundle, you typically get the dart, arrow, boomerang, or slingshot, plus other tools. At the dart and arrow level, you're gonna get the writer's jungle and either partnership writing and the arrow or the dart and jot it down. And this product is the same no matter what age your kids are. It's for you. It has activities to do with your kids, absolutely. And you're gonna take some time away to do it. And we give you uh, guidance with a bundle guide and then inside Brave Learner Home, I did a whole series of videos to walk you through how to do all three things together. So I'm not gonna reproduce that right now, but these three working together create quite a rich, complete program for you. You will find that your whole understanding of how to teach writing is transformed and it will benefit you for the entire lifespan of your children. Yeah, the, the Writer's Jungle, someone is saying, has awesome activities. They are enjoyable. They are enjoyable. The very first activity doesn't even involve writing. It's an oral game. And your kids are always shocked that the first thing they do in a writing, uh, in, in, with a writing curriculum is a game with words they say. <laughs> and it's fun. So I hope that helps you get a sense of where all this is going. Thank you for joining me live today. We've been at it for an hour, so I'm gonna wind up now. The replay will be available to those who registered. We'll get it up on the blog as well so that you can just watch it there once we upload it to YouTube. That may take a few days. Um, there are three more of these webinars at 1 p.m. on all the coming Tuesdays. So sign up, go to the blog, sign up and um, come. I'm gonna keep unpacking writing 
and uh, reading all this month. Thanks for joining me. Have a fantastic day and I'll see you online. <laughs>